Um, I'd like to ask my question again, putting it to the entire panel and also Debbie Steinberg, because I think she might have something to say about it. We've heard a lot about crustacean zooplankton and, and ecological stoichiometry, but do we have any insights uh, into how gelatinous zooplankton impact ecological stoichiometry or vice versa, how e stoichiometric, stoichiometric changes might influence the abundance or activities of gelatinous species? Raleigh, it's been years since I did that uh, ammonium excretion paper on gelatinous zooplankton. So, um, but we didn't, at that time, we didn't do um, full suite of stoichiometry. So I don't think there's really been much in a, in a stoichiometric sense. Please. <laughs> Crustacean zooplankton have a C to N of around five on average. Gelatinous zooplankton are a little lower, around four on average. There's a lot. There's a lot of variability. Um, and we'll, we did some experiments with tinafores and Skypha medusae in Chesapeake Bay, and there's a couple things I remember. Uh, one is that there's a really high amount of dissolved organic matter excretion, so something like 40% of the total um, phosphate or, or phosphorus or nitrogen excreted is as organic, dissolved organic matter. So that's something that's interesting, I think, about gelatinous zooplankton. Some of that could be excretion or maybe it's sloughing of mucus that then dissolves. Um, and, and the other thing is that um, the, it's not red field and it's really variable in terms of the, both the inorganic ratios, ammonia to phosphate, um, and also the organic ratio excretion, like DON to DOP was usually not at red field. Sometimes it was higher, sometimes it was lower. We see that with crustacean zooplankton too though, so, but there's very few experiments for gelatinous zooplankton on that. But you, yeah. So that's what we know so far, which is not a ton. Yeah. So I, I have a question for Bob. Um, so we've heard a thing from Tom about the importance of the DHAs, the essential uh, fatty acids. And you know, for Pat talked about mixotrophy. So is that still, um, is that still, can that be uh, enveloped into ecological stoichiometry? Because it has, you know, they, there's added factors. Maybe that's what you were talking about and not doing a revision of your book, because things are getting more complicated. But particularly, you know, when it comes to essential molecules yeah. that are not within the, canonical yeah. stoichiometry. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, that's, uh, I've thought about that a fair bit, and I mean, the easy answer is the more a biochemical acts like an element, the easier it is to incorporate in a stoichiometric framework. It has to be conservative, um, uh, and uh, when I have dived into the DHA and lipid literature in general, um, it's been very difficult for me to pull out general patterns from that literature. I'm sure there are some. I have no doubt that DHA and EPA and other biochemicals generally are very important nutritive factors in particular circumstances. Uh, maybe more important than phosphorus and nitrogen. I don't know. They, they clearly are. But can we, can we bring them into a stoichiometric framework kind of yes or no. We, we need these simple patterns, like you need a high DHA species and a low DHA species to, you know, to use this information the way we do, say, for phosphorus. And that's where things get kind of very confusing to me when I look at that literature. I guess, superficially, I have less problem thinking about incorporating mixotrophy, and Pat did a great job of showing how to do that. The form of nutrition, in, in a very abstract way, the form of nutrition isn't all that important in terms of using the tools of stoichiometry. Um, material comes in, it goes into biomass, it goes out. It doesn't matter so much whether it's using light energy or something else as a, as a reductant or, you know, a form of metabolism. Should work in, you know, hydrothermal vents. Um, 
uh, there are those exotic forms of nutrition. So, I, and I think that's way underexploited in us getting at what are these biological rules of of material use and how um, diverse organisms come together in a functioning whole, whether a community or ecosystem, using these examples where the metabolisms are completely different from what we normally, what we, most of us, normally think about. Um, I think that's really powerful experimental stuff, and I look forward to dozens and dozens of you know talks in the future of people doing that kind of stuff. May I comment on... If you treat um, micronutrients like fatty acids, if you assume they can't be synthesized by the consumer, or what have you, then you could treat them as elements. And I actually published a paper, Anderson and Pond 2000, in LNO, which just makes the case. It does, does an, an analysis of egg production by Calanus, as I remember, on that basis. Yep. So I think the, um, it, you, the, the theoretical framework is its basic sense is there, but the problem with it all is, um, as with elemental stoichiometry, is, is actually getting at all the metabolism and what's going on and, and um, the underlying rules for things like growth efficiencies. There's a lot more work to be done on that kind of stuff. But I do think there's more work to be done. Um, I see, still see the freshwater side, which I, I know a bit about, but certainly nothing like what Bob does, but where you have the kind of fatty acid um, literature all to do with and um, the elemental literature. And, I think more can be done to bring all that together, but to get at that, I think we have to get at more of the underlying physiology. So I have a question. In the last uh, number of years, we've learned how important the human gut biome is for our physiology and immune system. So in the marine world, you have shipworms, teredos, that eat wood, right? A CN ratio of 100, but they've got bacteria inside that fix nitrogen. And I'm just wondering how ubiquitous this is in the marine environment where gut microflora, say in the deep sea or whatever, could uh, the reverse of microbial gardening. They're living in the organism and then altering the nutrition. Do you have any insight on that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think there's um, there are other examples, and I'm stalling them in part because I I feel like I can't remember enough of the pieces of this, but ant eaters do things, and aphids, leaf cutter ants were mentioned. So this this way of cooperating with microorganisms to, I mean, this is a very anthropocentric way to phrase it, but cooperating with microorganisms to achieve some stoichiometric, you know, outcome. Um, I mean, at some level, that's what these consortia are doing, and. Um, I, I've sort of been waiting for the sort of spike of papers about stoichiometry and microbiome in general. Certainly, somebody has to be thinking about it with all the growing interest there. So I guess I'm sort of punting on that question, but I, I think it's a great question. I think uh, one thing to think about when you talk about gut microbes, I can't remember right, too much right now, is gut residence time. So if, your residence, if the gut residence time is very short, microbes are less likely to be able to kind of survive there. Compared to you know, um, a big animal like a cow, you're going to have plenty of skirt to, to harbor. So that's one aspect, at least, that is, is important. Is that long? Is I hear you. In your facility view, Denmark. Um, one of the things that has come up uh, recently, and I think, Carl, you mentioned it, Bob, you also talked about it, was uh, sort of like um, how stoichiometry might affect traits, right? So the actual functioning. Has anybody actually gone through, and especially, I don't know, maybe you can answer this for the lower end, for like, uh, you know, so the protist sort of end of the spectrum, it's easy to do that. So, you know, stoichiometry or the stoichiometric requirements of a particular organism, how do it affect actually the investment in chloroplasts and ribosomes and all these other things? Um, you know, and has anybody actually gone through and done the bookkeeping to sort of like see what that is in terms of functionality, what the demands then are, and the overall uh, stoichiometric requirements? I think in terms of um, a formal analysis that you're talking about, um, I'm not familiar with, um, but um, in terms of traits, we know that there are a number of um, traits in terms of uh, NDP, uh, 
condition and cell size and growth rate and these kinds of things track together, right? So um, we can we can think about um, and I've I've, I've, I've thought of a bit about this and um, have played around with publishing. Um, I published um, a new version of Margalef's mandala where I've <laughs> mapped all the different <laughs> traits uh, um, in terms of um, end of P, cell size, uh, preference for oxidized versus reduced nutrient, growth rate, um, tendency to be toxic, toxic what else? I can't even remember them all. <laughs> but, but yeah, tra traits do track each other in a qualitative sense. Doing the full accounting, I think that's really got to be done. Yeah, just mirroring on that, um, I, you know, I haven't seen a formal analysis done as of yet. But you know, some of the recent literature that's been coming out. In fact, there's a paper that came out pretty recently. You know, thinking about stoichiometry itself as a trait, and so if we can start thinking about um, the tissue stoichiometry as a trait in a, of itself, and linking it to some of the other traits that um, people have been cataloging, I think that would give a lot of power to think about how traits map onto. Um, changing biogeochemical <coughs> cycling. And, um, you know, there's some things known, but, you know, as far as like whether or not they're vertebrates or invertebrates and bones and something of that nature, but I think we have a long way to go and I would love to see that analysis done. Um, I had another question for Pat and, and just maybe to expand on a little bit more in terms of thinking about carbon flux in a shifting ecosystem towards mixotrophy and kind of just to ask you to sort of summarize what's known about carbon export in, an, in a system that's becoming mixotrophy dominated. We know more about export in diatom dominated systems and so I just wondered what your thinking has been, or the modeling efforts have shown. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, we have a long way to go to really understand uh, the full impacts, um, because <clears throat> um, while I highlighted the enhanced carbon fixation as well as enhanced DOC cycling, uh, the impacts, what are the impacts on uh, bacterial carbon cycling, what are the impacts on um, the carbon cycling that would come both from the grazer as well as the grazy? There is just so much yet to be um, understood. Uh, we're beginning to really understand where mixotrophy is found worldwide and what, um, what its impacts on sort of food webs are, but, but really getting a handle on this carbon flux is, is a real challenge. And so I've hinted at, at it here. I think the, um, <clears throat> the Warden Follows model suggests as we get more mixotrophy, larger cells, more sinking, um, we're taking small steps into understanding um, these huge impacts. Is 
I think that raises another really interesting and important point is that as systems shift towards mixotrophy, who's grazing those mixotrophs? And, and it's a very different community. Often they're not well grazed uh, compared to a diatom community. So um, the, the higher level trophic impacts are huge. Can I comment? I think um, I'm really glad that Pat picked up on mixotrophy today because I think it's one of the biggest, hottest topics. And I wonder, kind of in 10 years from now, whether ecosystem models being run in GCMs will look completely different to what they are today. The whole, apart from, from, from diatoms, which are purely autotrophic, pretty much everything else is mixotrophic. And I wonder whether there's a whole paradigm shift with everything that goes with it, export flux on the horizon. Let's give our speakers another hand.